and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top selling games from September 1989. I check out arcade software. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with a bit of hardware. But first, it's the news. It's a bit thin on the ground this month, but if your humour extends to double entendres and you laugh at fart jokes, then a new game from Virgin will be right up your street. Fizz, the popular comedy, childish cartoon magazine, is to be converted into a computer game for your spectrum. Yes, it seems some of the well-known characters will be present as well, including Johnny Fart Pants and Buster Gonads, etc, etc. I'm sure all those people that like that thing will love the game. Accolade, the American 16-bit software publisher, is looking to release games for the 8-bit machines, including the Spectrum, which some see as a step backwards. One of their first games to make the move will be Test Drive 2 The Duel. The game, as the title suggests, is a driving game featuring a Porsche 959 and Ferrari F40. Miles Gordon Technology have released a utility for Plus 3 owners that extends the commands they have access to when using the disk drive. The software tool has seven added commands, including B format, a routine to format disks to higher capacity, cat all for a complete catalogue of disks to screen or printer, and head copy that loads tape headers and detects if they can be transferred to disk. The whole package will set you back 1999. Jerry Anderson, the man responsible for some of TV's most famous puppet shows like Thunderbirds, has handed over a few licenses to Grand Slam, allowing them to be used in computer games. Grand Slam previously released Thunderbirds, and because Anderson was so impressed, so the story goes, he's released a few more to them, including Captain Scarlet. Watch out for some puppet fun coming soon. And that was the news, and now onto the top selling games. At number 5 is Run the Gauntlet by Ocean Software. At number 4, Dragon Ninja by Ocean. At number 3, Kenny Daldley, Soccer Manager from Cognito. At number 2, Crazy Cars 2 from Titus. And at number 1, Robocop 2 from Ocean Software. And that was the news and top selling games from September 1989. Arcade Software were not the best known company. In fact, even as an avid Spectrum user in the early 80s, I somehow overlooked them. They were not the most prolific company either, producing only 10 games and one compilation. And two of these games are missing in action. Their adverts may be familiar, but the games were a mystery, at least to me. With a bit of digging around, I managed to get all of the available titles from three different places so I can finally see what the company was selling. And of course, give myself a good opportunity to play some games. Here they are then, and the covers do look different from most other games being sold at the time. Ocean went for bright cartoony-like covers, Quicksilver opted for sci-fi artwork, and DKtronics, well, did their own distinctive thing. And then there was Arcade Software. Trying to pin down the order in which the games were released was troublesome, so I can only go by the first dates they were mentioned in magazines. The releases started in June 1983. Grid Run and Pontoon were released together, and I can find no evidence that they were released separately, so let's have a play. The Grid Run and Pontoon compilation were released in June 1983, and at first Grid Run looks like a poor Pac-Man clone, but the game plays much different. You still have to clear all the dots, but you can only use two keys for the control. One moves your car in one lane, and the other moves it out one lane. And you can only do this at the holes in the maze, and obviously you have to avoid the chasing car. The graphics, as you can see, are character-based and a bit bland, and the sound isn't too bad for an early game, I suppose, with some nice machine code effects for various aspects of the game. It's quite playable once you get into it, trying to time your move so that you don't hit the other car, but seems randomly to switch lanes. Interestingly, 
the author, Bruce Rutherford, was unhappy with the review of this compilation and wrote back to Home Computing Weekly, trying to put the reviewer straight on a few things. However, the reviewer responded and basically pointed out the flaws in both games. The reviewer thought Gridrun required a very little skill, and I'm not sure where I stand on this. Do you define skill as choosing when to swap lanes? Uh, maybe, who knows? On to Pontoon then, and as you would expect, it's based on the card game of the same name. Oh dear, that music. Make it stop. Nope, you can't. Ah, nothing seems to work. And trying to break out just made things worse. Once you sit through that awful tune, you get into the game itself, and the cards are huge. And, like most pontoon games, the play is a bit dull. The computer deals its own hand first, which you can't see, and then it shows you yours. And at this point you can either stick or twist. The winner is the one who gets closest to 21. This goes on, and on, and on. And after each game you are shown the current score, before it all starts again. The sound is basic, and by that I mean just beeps. Not the most exciting game ever. So let's move on in hope of finding something better. In June 1983 came Raiders of the Cursed Mine. Now this game, although not really original, isn't as bad as the title will have you believe. First the story. You are, as the title suggests, the Raider of Mines heading off into the great unknown in search of diamonds. However, one mine you enter is inhabited by evil spirits, and they're not happy with you stealing their jewels. The mine is displayed on screen as seven horizontal tunnels and three lifts, one at each side and one in the centre. Some tunnels are blocked by spider webs, and so you have to navigate around to grab the diamonds. The evil spirits have many ways in which to kill you. Some throw rocks at you from above, there's a ghost that pops up now and again and moves along and then vanishes randomly, and then of course they're the bats. These just take away points, whereas the others will kill you. If you walk into one of those spider webs, you'll be trapped and a spider will arrive and kill you anyway. Using the lifts you have to carefully navigate around and collect all of the diamonds. And the key to this game is patience and timing. While in the lifts, nothing can kill you, but your bonus reduces. But that's better than dying. You only get one life too, so you have to be extra careful. The graphics are smooth, but small and well defined. And they do their job, I suppose. They look like pre-shifted characters too, but that doesn't detract from the game. Control can often stick, leaving you motionless and open to attack, which can be very frustrating. But overall not a bad game, I suppose, and one I quite enjoyed. We're still in 1983, and two games arrived at the same time, both in October. The Detective. Now this game makes no sense at all, but then again it shouldn't need to, I suppose. The story is something to do with a detective trying to track down the mob and break into their safe. However, as you can see, it's a shoot 'em up. Now this is supposed to represent Dagger Alley, and you have to get through it to get to the safe. However, for a 40s gangster plot, it sure looks like a space shooter to me. The game very much reminds me of Arcadia from Imagine Software, and each level has a different set of aliens moving in different attack patterns. There's also this centipede-like thing that sort of grows and can't be destroyed and then drops down, and more annoyingly, a dog that chases you off the side of the screen. The inlay states that if you make it to the final level, you've got ten guesses at the safe combination. Needless to say, I never made it that far. It's not a bad shooter though, the action is fast and the graphics for 1983 are okay, and there's some good sound effects here. It's certainly a challenge to play, and you do want to keep going to see what the next level will throw at you. Just like Arcadia though, as the level ends and there are less and less aliens, they do speed up, making them really difficult to hit. The movement of the main character, although smooth, always ends in 8 pixels, so the position is always fixed, 
and this means your shots have to be 8 pixels offset to hit the aliens. In other words, you can't shoot an alien directly below it. You have to be 8 pixels to the left or to the right. I think you can see what I mean by watching the gameplay. The games are improving as time goes on though, so let's see what the next one is like. This is Last Sunset for Latica, and this game sees you in a maze trying to defuse a bomb. Oh dear, this is a very bad Berserk clone. The walls are deadly, as you can see, so you have to be careful, and movement is very tricky because it's so fast, and it's difficult not to keep bumping into walls. The sound is okay, I suppose, but everything else is a bit awkward. There are far too many enemies about, some of them shooting at you, and this means it isn't long before you're dead. Slowing things down, and not going in firing at everything, and the game does get a little better, but there are places where the rooms don't match up, and you try and exit at the bottom of the screen, and you are bound straight back because the wall draws for the lower screen, and then obviously you can't get there. Very bad design. I did find a key at one point, but I never found a use for it. You can also fall foul of the instant death syndrome. Getting shot by an alien, if you are close, and you resurrect right next to it at the same point, and the alien fires again, and you die. Again and again. Very frustrating. It's a simple game that could have been much better, but it's far too frustrating to enjoy. And that was it for 1983. We now move on to 1984, and the first game is Bubble Trouble. The release date on World of Spectrum claims 1982, however the first mention in any magazine is January 1984. Here we have a simple yet enjoyable maze game, where you play a burglar out to steal as much as you can. Now I'm not sure about the ethics of this game, but we'll ignore that for the time being. A single chasing bubble wanders about, with seemingly no intelligence at all, and you have to simply avoid it and grab the goodies. Once you've got them all, you can then start grabbing the bonus points while waiting for the timer at the bottom left of the screen to run out. Once it runs out, a new maze is drawn and it all starts again. Movement is smooth, but the sprites are a bit dull. Luckily control is good enough, meaning you don't get caught easily. Sound is basic with a few tunes and spot effects, but nothing that sounds anything other than basic beeps. The maze is easy to navigate, but some of the colour schemes make your eyes bleed. Once you've completed a few mazes, there's no change in gameplay really, so you can either try a harder difficulty level, or give up and play something else. The next game to arrive in June 1984 is The Prize. This game came with full page adverts claiming you could win £5,000 of money. However, Reading the inlay, the dreadful truth comes out. For each copy of the game sold, 20 pence would be set aside for the prize, and this will keep being added until £5,000 is reached. If it doesn't get that high, then the prize will be however much they manage to get. This means that to make £5,000 prize money, they would have had to have sold 25,000 copies. Mm, bit of a tall order that, I think. I never heard of anyone actually winning this prize either, unlike other games that offered things to win. Anyway, to the game itself. You have to enter a maze, find the inner chamber, and find its secrets. And then you've won! Hurrah! Oh, this is just like Last Sunset at Latica. The maze looks the same, only instead of man running about, you control a spaceship. But luckily if you collide with the walls, you don't die. I think this is an updated version, surely. There are some different elements like moving walls and, and less aliens, but there's still the instant death syndrome. There are less enemies about, which is a good thing, and it plays at a more leisurely pace. Some screens are easy to get through, others, especially ones with the moving walls, aren't, and it's all about timing. The control is good, and it needs to be, and the ship responds well. Sometimes you come across an energy base where you can get a shield that will protect you, and I also found a room with a mysterious box in it, but nothing seemed to happen when I collided with it. Later on I found another object, and I think this is one of the code pods that you have to collect. You have to get these in numerical order, so this one here is number two, obviously not the first one. Oh well, off in search of number one then. It's not a bad game once you get into it, and master the moving walls thing, but it's still a pain when you get repeat instant deaths. 
Incidentally, this game was still being advertised in August 1985, so the prize had still not been claimed. Moving on a few months, and December 1984, we see Thurbo released. Now this game has me completely baffled. I've read the convoluted instructions, played the game many times, and still have absolutely no idea what I'm controlling or what I'm supposed to do. Sometimes things respond to my controls, sometimes they don't. Sometimes a goal is scored, but I've no idea how, why, or what the purpose was, or who scored it. And sometimes things just explode for no reason I can see. Sometimes I get control of the Thurbo, whatever that is. It's all a mess and not very clear, and as such I really didn't enjoy playing this. My first game I apparently won 5 nil, but I've no idea how. The graphics are nondescript. I think one of them is a tank of some kind, because now and again you get to control it and you can fire, but I don't know what the purpose of that is either. Sound is a mixture of basic beeps and machine code effects, some of which are quite good. But at the end of the day, it, it's all too confusing. As 1984 came to an end, a new game was advertised called The Zone. Now the company claimed it would take years to complete, and it was an adventure game that would have full screen, high resolution images, and a large vocabulary. In an article in Micro Adventurer, they said the game would be loaded in four parts, and will adapt the puzzles you face based on how well you solved earlier ones. Now whatever this game was, we'll probably never see it, because it wasn't released as far as I can see, and there was never any reviews of it anywhere. All fell silent for arcade software after this until February 1986, that's quite a long time, when a new game was sent to the magazines for review. It was the follow-up to Raider of the Cursed Mine, a game called Raiders of the Lost Ring. Now the magazines were not too impressed with this, Crash claiming it was just another Jet Set Willy ripoff and not a pretty good one, with uninspiring graphics. The screenshots don't look too impressive either. Now this game is also missing in action, but it seems to have been completed, as there were reviews in several magazines and even an inlay being shown. Sadly, we may never get to see this one either. And that was the last thing we hear about arcade software. No more games or mentions in magazines, no more news or anything. They seem to have slipped away quietly into obscurity. The games are a mixture of below average simple arcade games to mediocre maze games with a few frustrating games thrown into the mix. They produced nothing outstanding, and nothing different to all of the other companies producing games at the same time, and maybe this is why they vanished quietly. At least we have most of the games to play, and of course those inlays, which for me are really impressive, and make the company stand out from many other publishers at the time. <laughs> This is Space Harrier 2, released by Grand Slam in 1990. This is the second in the series, as the title would suggest, but let's jump back a little before we play this one. Welcome to the Fantasy Zone. Get ready. Space Harrier was originally released in the arcades by Sega in 1985. It was a 3D run and gun game with impressive graphics, a tiled scrolling ground, some nice music, massive monsters, good sound and speech. It was great to play in the arcades too. Conversions were soon out for the more powerful consoles, with Sega's own machines getting some of the better ports, especially the Dreamcast. Home computer and console versions followed, with the C64, Amstrad and Mega Drive getting their own versions amongst others. The Spectrum would always struggle with this style of game. It doesn't have the hardware to move large blocks of graphics around and it doesn't have sprite scaling something that was used in the arcades. It was, though, quite a good game, to be honest. The graphics were large and well-defined, and the action was very reminiscent of the arcade. The main character could walk or fly using his jet-powered laser cannon, avoid rocks and trees, as he made his way to complete mayhem and destruction. In 1988 then came Space Harrier 2, released by Grand Slam, and it's much of the same. Ready? Flying along, shooting things and generally having fun. The graphics look really nice, well drawn and clearly based on the arcade machine, and things move smoothly and the action is fast and furious.
things arrive from the distance firing missiles, and they get larger as they approach, as you'd expect. And the speed is helped by a reduced playing area. The rest of the screen though is taken up by a panel that serves no real purpose. You have to dodge the missiles and land-based obstacles like rocks and trees as mentioned before, and of course shoot back. Every now and then you get a large boss fight, and these take a lot of hits to get rid of. You can, if you want, run along the ground, or take to the air, and the main sprite changes angle and animation as you do this. The sound has two settings, music and no music. If you have no music, then you get a lacklustre sound effect sound. Very poor they are too, with a weak firing sound and similarly bad explosions. A bit poor considering it was a 128k game. If, however, you choose music, then you get a nice tune while you're playing, although it does slow down when there's a lot happening on screen. And you get digitised speech as well. Difficulty-wise, it's about the same as the arcade game, but it's made harder due to the colour restrictions. Sometimes it can be tricky to see the enemy, especially if they're drawn on the ground. And because the colours are monochrome, everything tends to get mixed together. Control is good and responsive, and overall I quite like this version of the game. The nearest I got to play in the original was having a few goes on the Dreamcast at one of the retro events, but the gameplay and feeling of that has transferred pretty well to the Spectrum. I spent a while playing this, and although it has its flaws, for example the music slowing down and poor sound effects if you don't have music, and the attribute jump as the horizon changes height, it's quite an impressive achievement overall. Death Rally X was released by Tom Dolby in 2018. Maze Death Rally X is a conversion of the 1981 arcade game Rally X, and a damn fine conversion it is too. The game involves driving around a maze and collecting flags, and in your way are various things to hinder you, like rocks, a fuel limit and other cars. On the first level there's only one chasing car, but these increase as you get through the levels. The game has continuous music that's very similar to the arcade game, and the graphics are well drawn and well implemented. There are other versions of this game already on the Spectrum, but this one is far the closest to the arcade, and is really great fun to play. The controls can be a little bit of a problem at times, and it's difficult to say just what is happening, but when you approach a wall or corner, the car can turn itself, and at the same time, if you press a different direction, it doesn't always pick up. But that's just a minor point, because apart from that, this is a thoroughly enjoyable game, and certainly worth checking out. Right, so this, I believe, was a re another request from Patreon about typing memories. Now, I think we've talked a little bit about this before, but uh, we can go a bit deeper, see see what we can trawl up from our brains. So you, you have done a lot of typings anyway, Paul, because you have a section on the show about typings. I have. I've done a lot of typings, and I have a lot of old tapes with typings in, which I have stacked away somewhere. Some of them... Are, were featured in the show because they weren't typed in previously, and some of them, things like Hunchy from Your Computer, for example, the one on World of Spectrum is the one that I typed out, so that's fine. But yeah, I have done a lot of other typings for the show, just for Typing Corner, and it is frustrating. It's, it, it, it is as frustrating as you remember it, and it is annoying when it doesn't work. Although, to be honest, if you... I don't know whether... Um, I didn't understand the language or the structure back then, but typing in listings now, I find it a lot easier, and the success rate is a lot higher. I'm getting about 
75% work first time. I have, I've only found one game, I think, that when I typed it out, I couldn't get it working and never could get it working. So that's not bad. Do you do what I do in that if you have a bit of machine code in the typing and it's a loads of data blocks, you end up getting them wrong just because it's so difficult to keep track and know what you're doing and your brain starts to go numb just typing number after number after number. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because the way it's printed in a magazine, I think you get like three or four numbers on a line and there's lines and lines of the stuff. Yeah. I always try and, I try and stay away from masses of machine code because I'm no machine code expert and there's, if, it, if it was wrong because it was printed wrong in the magazine, there's no way I'll be able to fix it. But smaller things, maybe, I don't know, maybe just a sound effect or something that... If need be, you could actually take out and just check that that, that was causing it to crash. Then you know, I, I don't mind a bit of that. But actually, are there any Spectrum emulators that let you cut and paste from text into the emulator? Because that might yes, be a there nice is, shortcut. Yeah. yeah, basing. I didn't know so that. A, a utility called basing, where you can copy and paste text in, and it will compile uh, not compile it, but it will run it and in, in a Spectrum emulator and see if it works so you can actually yeah you can in, in theory you can scan ocr and then paste it into basin but <laughs> depends on the quality of the ocr software and obviously the the magazine it was scanned from yeah do, do type in porks from magazines because quite often you'd get a big block of data in a pork listing as well wouldn't you yeah no i, I always stayed clear of that one of the first things i got was a multi-face one so i could just enter the pokes anyway so i didn't i stayed, stayed clear of all that the main thing that I found with typings is trying to interpret what the listing was. And one game that I did type out, somebody had called a variable RND and not. <laughs> so, so, so it wasn't the RND function. It was a variable called RND. RND. So obviously I put in RND as the function yep. and the game just wouldn't work. And I spent hours trying to figure out why it didn't work. And right at the very, after, I don't know, two or three hours, I suddenly realized that R&D was actually a variable name and not the name of, uh, not the function name. That, that drove me crazy. So I had something very, very similar. Um, it wasn't a function name. It was that the spectrum had a separate keyword for greater than, or, not equals to, a greater than or a less than. Oh, yeah. And yeah. in one particular typing, I'd seen that, typed a greater than, then a less than. So it looked exactly right. Um, <laughs> and it wouldn't work, wouldn't enter. And it took me ages to realise. I think this is only a few weeks after I got my Spectrum, so I wasn't used to kind of the keywords and how they worked. And yeah, right, okay. I can I can imagine that causing problems because it would look exactly the same. Like R&D looked the same as R&D, but yeah. yeah. The the other thing, my other abiding memory is you'd spend hours typing something in, run it without saving. It was oh, crap, I... but the amount of times I would type in a listing and foolishly run it before saving it. Oh, no. And then yeah. your computer would lock and you go, oh, no, when you be trying break. Yeah, when magazines print things and the, the quality, either the quality of the paper or the background and the text colour make it really tricky to read, then you get all sorts of problems. Or the listing goes all the way to the kind of crease and you can't see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, happy memories. Or they decided to print it like really dark grey on black. Oh, no. Or, no. or yellow on white. Reason. Oh, God. <laughs> Did you ever find any really nice kind of hidden gems in typings? Yeah, no. The one, the one thing that's the one that springs to mind is a magazine put out a listing which was all. Um, I wouldn't say it was encrypted, but it was written in such a way that you couldn't tell what it was. And, and it said, I think it was an April Fool's joke. And when it actually, when you typed it all in and run it, it just said something like "April Fool." Was it long? <laughs> I think it was about half a page. Oh, <laughs> How annoying would that have been? I think that's typings. Just so that, that's my typing memories. Uh, a mixture of feeling wonderful when it all worked and very proud, and then frustration when things didn't work and you, no matter what you did, you couldn't get it to work for no fault of your own. It was either the, the original ri listing was wrong or the magazine print was wrong. I think mine are mainly frustration as well. <laughs> This is Goldmine, released by DK Tronics in 1983. The program, unusually, has a demonstration and instruction program on the tape that takes you through how the game works and gives you a little demo. I'm not aware of many games that have this kind of extra, and only Timegate from Quicksilver spring to mind. On to the game then. You control a miner who has to collect gold nuggets. 
The nuggets are marked on screen, however, they can also be other things too. When you run into them, there will either be a reward with some cash, a rock fall that fills in the tunnel behind you, solid rock so you have to dig around it, or even worse, water that floods the tunnel. Digging uses up energy, so things like rock falls will mean you have to use more energy to dig your way around them. And you have to keep your eye on the energy too. Once you collect a few nuggets, you head back to the surface using the lift. Don't try and get into the lift shaft any other way. You can only carry 15 nuggets at a time, so it's advisable to head back before that, and when you have a clear tunnel to go back through, and of course enough energy to make it. At first this game seems a bit dull, but there are a lot of things to consider when playing. The graphics are small and character based, and move in 8 pixel jumps, as most early 16k games did. Control is ok, but can sometimes feel unresponsive, and the sound is standard beeps. Yes, it's nothing special. It's worth having a quick go though if you like this sort of thing, but probably you would never have more than a few games. One of the criticisms aimed at the Spectrum was the sound output. Not only did it have a one bit beeper, but also a tiny speaker. Other micros use the TV for sound output, so to get a better quality output you had a few options. You could fit an internal telesound device, or get an external amplifier. I covered one of these, the ZX Box, in a previous episode, but this is the Stone Chip Amplifier, and was much more well known. It first appeared in magazines a few months after the Spectrum was released, around September 1982, and initially called the Stone Chip Echo, and it sold for £23.50. A few months later though, and the price dropped to 1995, much more affordable. There were two versions of this amplifier, the early one with rotary controls, that was on sale from 1982 to 1984, and then the newer model. I can't track down exactly when this newer version arrived, but it's easily identified because it has switches instead of dials. The styling fits really well with the 48k Spectrum, and the unit looks great next to it. The unit is well made, and is made out of plastic, and it's got a quite a solid feel to it. It's got a nice speaker grill on the front, and the controls on the top. Some pictures I've seen show the unit on the right hand side of the Spectrum, but the leads that it's supplied with just don't allow this, they're not long enough, and only let the device sit to the left. The amplifier allows you to pass through the cassette leads as well as the power, but seeing as though I'm not using a cassette these days, we'll leave those out. On the back of the device there are power connectors that go to the computer, and to the power unit, there's ear and mic sockets for the cassette, and ear and mic sockets to the computer. The switches on top allow you to switch between load and save, and the beep amp. And you also have volume choices of high and low or off completely, and of course there's the power switch. Let's start with a the game then, using the internal speaker. First, here's Death Chase. As you can hear, or rather not hear, it's not very loud. Now let's play it with the stone chip amp connected, and the volume set to low. Yes, that's much better, and just about right for normal gaming. Let's try a higher volume. Yes, that really does get a bit louder. Maybe useful for playing games with some music in the background, belting out from your Amstrad Tower Hi-Fi system. This is a nice little amplifier. It looks great, and it certainly sounds nice. Some game music though sounded a bit odd, sort of distorted, and I've no idea why. But overall, it was a great little addition back in the day, and not too bad today either. <laughs> <laughs> 